the chain of responsibility design pattern this i believe is a design pattern that's not very commonly understood nor is it commonly used it's still very interesting and worth our studying it so what is the chain of responsibility the chain of responsibility allows us to decouple the sender of a request with the receiver when a request comes in from a sender it's basically handed over to one receiver and then to another and then to another which are chained together kind of like a linked list at one point one of the receivers will say i know how to handle this request and at that point the chain is terminated so the sender of the request doesn't really need to know who in the chain is handling it the request is passed on from one processing element to another till an element says i know how to process this request leave it to me take a look at this diagram which kind of shows you how the chain of responsibility pattern looks diagrammatically we have the client at the very beginning which is sending a request the client doesn't really need to know which of the receivers or which of the processing elements will process the request he only needs to deal with the head of this queue and the processing elements pass the request down till it's finally processed the sender interacts only with the very first receiver in the queue let's think a little bit about how exceptions are handled in code we look at an example from java but pretty much all languages which support exceptions handle exceptions in exactly this manner say we have a method where things can go wrong and when things go wrong this method throws an exception so let's look at this java example if you look at the code on screen you see there is a method one which takes in a random number and throws two kinds of exceptions io exception and null pointer exception this is a pretty realistic case the code in it is kind of made up but the fact that method 1 can throw either of these exceptions is pretty realistic so we basically say if the random number is equal to 1 we throw an io exception and if it's 2 we throw a null pointer exception things can go wrong in two specific ways in this method the code inside the function could lead to two types of exceptions being thrown this the function specifies by including the exceptions that it can throw as a part of its signature this signature basically tells the outside world which calls this method that i do not handle the io exception and the null pointer exception that i throw if you want to call me then you'll have to handle it yourself what does that mean for the calling code the method signature implies that io exception and null pointer exception both can be thrown by this method one any code calling this method must either catch these exceptions and make sure that they do something after catching it like recover from it in some way or that code must announce that it through to throws these exceptions then that code basically says to the outer world i don't handle these exceptions you need to let's say we now have a method 2 which calls this method 1 method 2 also takes a random number and simply passes this on to method 1 this method knows how to handle one out of the two types of exceptions that method 1 throws if you look on screen this method knows how to handle the null pointer exception it simply prints it out to screen but this method does not know what to do with the other exception remember that method 
also through the IO exception. This method does not know what to do with it. So it kind of pass it to its calling code. And this it specifies as a part of its signature. Now let's set up another method, method three, which in turn calls method two. This method three knows what to do with the remaining type of exception. If you remember, method two did not handle the IO exception. Instead, it passed it on to its calling code and indicated that via its signature. So here we have method three. It's calling method two and catching the IO exception. Now in this entire chain of method three calling method two calling method one, all of the announced type of exceptions are now handled. The code that finally calls method three doesn't need to do anything. It has no known exceptions that it needs to handle. So let's see how that code looks. Let's say it's called from the main method of a class. It simply calls method three with a random number. There is no try catch needed at all. Let's see what this chain of calls look diagrammatically. We have the main method it calls method three. This calls method two in its turn, which finally calls method one. Now remember, something can go wrong in method one. Let's say it does. An exception gets thrown. This can be one of two types, either a null pointer exception or an IO exception. So these are the two exceptions that method one announces can happen within itself. This exception goes up one level up the stack to method two. Method two knows what to do with one of these exceptions. So it basically catches the null pointer exception and handles it correctly. So if the exception is a null pointer exception, this method knows what to do with it. it handles it correctly, we are good. It's accepted the responsibility for the null pointer exception. But if it's an IO exception, method 2 basically throws up its hands and says, I have no idea what to do with it. I'll declare in my signature that it's possible to throw an IO exception if you call me. And it passes it on to the calling function. Method 3 knows what to do with the IO exception. It accepts responsibility for any IO exception that occurs. Function knows what to do with it. But now let's say there is an exception which is neither a null pointer exception nor an IO exception. Method 3 is helpless here. It just passes it on to the main. Main has no try catch block in its code. It doesn't know what to do with any exceptions which bubble up. So whatever exception reaches this point is simply exposed to the outside world, which means it's printed out to the standard error stream. Main doesn't know what to do with exceptions. It simply gives up and the exception is thrown in the program and printed to screen. What we've described so far is a really neat way of handling exceptions because it allows each bit of code to focus on those exceptions that it knows how to deal with. Each bit of code takes responsibility for those exceptions which it knows how to handle. The rest kind of throws up its hands, its hands and passes the responsibility on to someone else. Since I've been using the term responsibility, this is pretty much exactly the chain of responsibility design pattern. Another classic use case of this design pattern is how user interfaces handle mouse clicks. So you have a UI application, it has a whole bunch of controls within it. Most of those controls are responsive to mouse clicks. 
UI applications are often built on the composite pattern, meaning the outermost container contain UI controls within it, which contain UI controls within it. So they're composed of UI controls. So these nested windows, when they receive a mouse click or when they know a mouse click has occurred when a user clicks on it, they pass the mouse click action down from one to another. Basically, the most nested control will receive it first. If it doesn't handle it, it passes it to the outer control. If that doesn't handle it, it passes it further. Till some window has a handler for the mouse click. Now, let's say in all of this, the events get passed on one to the other, one to the other, and no one takes responsibility for an event. So the event gets passed down the chain of responsibility and nobody claims responsibility. Nobody takes ownership. What happens in this case? Think of design patterns as very similar to real life. When nobody takes responsibility for an action in real life, it simply falls through the cracks. This is the chain of responsibility design pattern.